All right. Hey, we're excited to have, have you here today. Uh, we are here doing talking about endotechniques. And today's session, I think, is really exciting because I've got Dr. Ramos to talk about the questions and answers, like a, kind of a Q&A of what he's already presented. But then I'm going to press him for a little bit more. You know, being a general practitioner myself, um, endodontics can sometimes be a challenge. So I'm looking, looking for today's session to answer some of the questions that I have being a general practitioner. So for those of you that haven't attended a previous session, just some really quick introductions. I want to introduce Carlos, Dr. Carlos Spirinelli Ramos, and he can say it so much more elegantly than I can, because I can't <laughs> roll an R, I can't say anything. But the background of Dr. Ramos is that he holds both a master's and a PhD degree in endodontics. He's been head of the endodontic department at Londrina State University in Brazil. For 18 years, he did that. And he's been involved in teaching, uh, researching, and product development and endodontics for over 25 years. So even though he looks pretty young, he's been at this for quite a long time. <laughs> and I think as you will see today, Dr. Ramos's passion, and he's got a ton of it, that Brazilian passion in education is really focused on streamlining endodontic protocols by innovating, innovating the instrumentation and the protocols. And it's really to, to strive to simplify but make us much more effective when we do our endodontic procedures. He's currently the clinical affairs director at Metadenta, and that's that's a, a, a great asset for Metadenta to have. And uh, myself, I'm actually in practice today in between uh, patients, and I'm a general practitioner in Sacramento, California, and I am proud to say that Dr. Ramos is a mentor to me, and uh, I, I really appreciate that. So as we're doing this intro, I'm going to admit somebody there. So we have uh, somebody who's just joined us. So welcome. So Carlos, how are you doing today? Oh, Dr. Mike, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm doing awesome. Thank you very much. Very hot here in Las Vegas. As you know, um, in Celsius, it is 42 degrees. That is a lot of degrees in Celsius, but it is hot and it's nice. It's weekend, Friday, right? So it's awesome to be here with you. Uh, Dr. Mike is my, my friend and is uh, one of the lecturers that I like to see the most. I remember the first time that I saw him in Hawaii and I was astonished with a lot of information about the physiology, about everything related, has a very nice, very nice approach. Let's put it in this oh, way, dentistry. Thanks, Mike, for being part of this uh, little program that we are putting together. This is the third time that we do our webinar. I'm very proud of this little program that is essentially what we want to do in the future, near future, actually, expand uh, webinars, expand in-person um, uh, seminars as well, with hands-on and a lot of things that is our go and I know that Dr. Mike Miyazaki will love to join us on this on this program as I will love to join him in his programs as well. Yeah okay. I look forward to I, I have so much fun working with you it's going to be a lot of fun Thank as we you. go into the future. <laughs> Thank you. Well well so we have some others join us right now so I'm going to just give them just a few seconds they're uh, connecting up to audio so I'm letting them in and the uh, the one thing I was hoping you were going to say, Carlos, is that you enjoyed seeing me uh, in Hawaii because of the bathing suit, but I guess that's not the case. <laughs> <laughs> bathing suits to Americans and to Brazilians means something totally different. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That is true. That is true. Well, why don't we jump in? Uh, people are still coming in. But um, so I asked Carlos, I said, can you be kind of our, our mentor through endodontics? So many of us as general practitioners, don't really have a mentor, somebody who can turn to to ask questions. And Carlos's passion and just as and also his compassion to help uh, really makes him the ideal uh, person to help us with this. So I'm thinking of today as kind of being the the Carlos Ramos 411 to avoid a 911. You know, which means we want to enter into our endodontic procedures knowing what we what we're planning to do with some confidence, so we can avoid any kind of emergency, which for many of us just means more stress and we don't need that in our practice. Yeah. So I was asking Carlos, can we start at the top? 
and kind of work our way down the tooth. And I know maybe we can come back to a session, you know, starting at the very top would be diagnosis. And I think we can come back to that. But if we get a tooth that really needs, and we know it needs a root canal and endodont procedure, um, Carlos, I just want to ask you, how, how, you know, one of the hardest things for me is making that access, making sure I don't perforate the tooth as I'm making my access, mm -hmm. and then finding all the canals. And so, you know, if you could maybe give some tips that uh, helps us do this efficiently and make, you know, making sure that we find all the canals that are there. Sure, sure, absolutely. And, and by the way, this is, I, I, I love to see this kind of questions because this open a lot of opportunity to give some very, very important uh, suggestions and, and, and why not to say some tips on what we experience along the years. So uh, the first thing, First slide that I want to, to show is um, this one. So loops, um, loops and microscopes. So magnification. I think that first thing that you have to invest if you want really to avoid some perforations, especially during the access uh, phase, or, or we call in Portuguese, the, the name of the access is so important that is uh, access is called surgical access. Mm. We, we say in Portuguese, but the access preparation is, is so important and so complicated when you are doing a molar, for example, that you see that X-ray and the pulp chamber and the pulp chamber floor and the pulp chamber ceiling are practically connecting with each other. So that is one of the most challenging situations that as a, if I am a GP, and I take an x-ray and I see that kind of calcification, that level of calcification that not only in the poke chamber, but goes inside the root canal as well. Those are cases that I think that I need to refer <laughs> or the endodontist, yeah. is especially if you have a crown. Well, if you do have a crown and you want to keep that crown and you have a calcification, there's no question I will refer. Why? Because it take, if I am successful in finding the canals entrances, I will take four, 40 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour to find it. So, but in a practical basis, in a day-to-day -day situation, we can use loops, but my prefer is the microscope. So the microscope for me is kind of a periscope. It's more like I use when I need and I just put back. And the reason is, is not everybody that is that kind of a operator that likes to do anesthesia with the microscope. Mm -hmm. So uh, microscope not only helps, as you know, not only helps the uh, situation of the finding canals, but everything related with dentistry, everything related with dentistry. Let me do one thing here. Uh, enable, play sound, I will not play the sound. Okay, so everything that you're doing in dentistry needs magnification. Let's give one example, a prep. So the cervical termination or of your prep inside a little bit on the border or a little bit inside gingiva. If you have a microscope and an ultrasonic device, you can use the burr on the micro ultrasonic device and you can do that prep much more is a more a fine tuning on your prep with the microscope. You can see exactly what you have and the impression material as well. After doing your impression, if you see the result under the microscope, you can avoid problems and redo the, the impression, for example, or uh, avoiding problems with your technician. Not only that, but to see caries lesion, to see everything inside the mouth is so tiny, so little. And if you see little things with your microscope, you can determine the importance of doing uh, something else, like remove the caries, keep the caries, whatever you want to do. So first and foremost, magnification. This is very important, not only for determining uh, the, the position of the canal orifices, but to clean a pulp chamber, for example, after you finish your obturation, 
and you want to clean the pulp timber, to put a post or even to do your restoration. You don't want pieces of gutta percha or pieces of sealer on the denting walls in, in, in there because you want to bond your, your, your restoration. And to do that, you have to have a clean pulp chamber and that is very important as well. So basically magnification gives you uh, a, 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 a boost on your uh, determination of the canal orifices. Look this case and why I put this bird there because this is the thing that you don't want to do or you, you have to avoid when you have the right depth, that is pretty much six to eight millimeters depth, and you don't find the pulp chamber floor, stop right away, take an x-ray, put your microscope or even your good loops and start to use ultrasonics because you are dealing with a very classified pulp chamber. And this is exactly the case you can see here, let me show with laser pointer, you can see here uh, what is probably the one canal entrance, another one here, but you cannot see anything here. And that is pretty much a calcification of the poke chamber floor with the poke chamber ceiling. And it's always a little space there. It will be always a little space there. And why? Because you cannot, there's no junction, there's no full, complete, solid calcification. There's no way of doing that. The same cells that do the calcification, they will stay there, even though it's a thin layer and you cannot see with your eyes, but with a microscope and loops, you can see sometimes some uh, parts, let's put it in this way, some uh, traces of the original pulp chamber. Mm -hmm. So right away, I will change for a uh, ultrasonic tip. And why I want that? This is one very common situation. A perforation of the pump cha pope chamber. Pope chamber. <laughs> <laughs> not the guy in Italy, not the pope. It's pope. <laughs> the pope chamber. And this is really something that create two, two big situations. One, you postpone your treatment and you are going to have way more time to deal with this case. Second one, you lose a lot of money because you mm -hmm. are pretty much throwing away all the money that you should get with this molar, you know, in an hour, and you are doing the treatment that you take two sections or three sessions of one hour. And we are going to talk a little bit about how to deal with this perforation, but to avoid perforation is way more important than how to deal with the perforation. perforation. Of course, accidents happen, but to deal with perforation is always more cost, more time, etc. So here is one of the things that I designed. This is called the trumpet tip. And I know that you use it uh, already, and this is super new. We barely launch this, but this design, it took me two years of test and redesigning. And the most important thing is the machine to do that. Because this is, of course, here is an magnification. You can see apparently it's big, but this is the tip of a number 70 file. Mm. It is 0 0.70 millimeters is the base of the trumpet. And then comes here, here will be around something around 35, 40. So this is a very thin, very little tip that the intention is to go to the pope chamber floor, will not hurt the pope chamber floor because you know that vibration is laterally, and then we we'll cut, gently cut laterally, and this little projection of the trumpet will go exactly in the pope chamber, little, little pope chamber space that has between the floor and the ceiling. Let's see. So this is a good example of the use of the trumpet. So I'm using the trumpet and let's see here. You see the trumpet goes to this little space and up and down, you start to remove the Pope chamber ceiling, right? Pope yeah. chamber ceiling there. And then you start to remove and then you start to 
uh, uh, see the real Pope chamber uh, uh, space there, right? And here, of course, I had a little bit more space that uh, uh, I, I wanted to show, but it's just to show how the trumpet will work against these walls and gently without hurting the Pope chamber floor. And this is very important. If I'm using a burr, the round burr, you always touch the Pope chamber floor and deform the Pope chamber floor. Another thing that is important to say, the Pope chamber floor has what we call the rostrum canalis. Rostrum canalis of the face of the canal. Rostrum in Latin and in Portuguese, French, Italian, and Romanian, rostrum is the face, right? Face, yeah. my hosto. This is my hosto. Okay, so the hostum canali is these lines that connect all the uh, canal entrances. So if I took a burr and it start to work there, I lose this map uh, that is pretty much in important. The second tip that I like to use after the trump is the scout. So the scout is a 0.25 tip. It's very, very, very little. Actually is the the smaller diameter tip available for ultrasonics. And it's, it, it, it is staying still, and you are going to use with ultrasonics, number three power, 30% of your power. And after the trump, you just put as, as, your, um, as your instrument, like if, when you want to probe the canal, you have a, a hand instrument that is exactly the same design, but this is smaller than the others. And then you can probe the canal and you scout the canal with vibration. Laterally, you open a little bit as well. So the trumpet and the scout, those two little chips that will give you a little bit more uh, chance of finding canals. Look at this case. This is very interesting. Look at that. This is the fourth canal or the MB2 in this upper molar. As you can see, I have a, a long distance between the palatal and the M, 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 MB. So the MB2 will be in the middle or a little bit displaced to buccal. And if I work with the trumpet and see that I'm going back and forth following the Pope chamber floor, I can touch the Pope chamber floor, nothing will happen. Actually, I'm polishing the Pope chamber floor. As you can see now, I found the fourth canal. So after the trumpet, I came, I will go with my scout and I, well, this is one canal. I found one canal, yoo -hoo. So now it's time to go with my scout and go inside. You see number 10, very, very little. I barely can put a number 10 there, right? So after yeah. that, with my scout, I will go with my scout there and I start to back and forth. Try to keep the scout free because ultrasonics works in later, laterally, right? So the vibration is always laterally. But if I put my ultrasonics and I press too much, that vibration will not go. So the good thing about ultrasonics or the best way of using ultrasonics is always with the tip a little bit free. So as you can see here, my scout is open and not only open, but I start to do some uh, removal of the tissue as well. So this is a fresh stracked third molar that I fortunately I found this MB2. So now you can see the MB2 a little bit more open. Now I, I, I go with my number 10 a little bit uh, with a little bit more space. So for the next number of dentistry today that will come next week probably, you see my, that I wrote a paper and in this paper, I show this C molar. This is a C shape uh, uh, molar. That is one of the worst scenarios to do endodontics. Why? Because you have all the three canals together. It is a kind of a big isthmus connecting everything. It's so hard to clean, right? So I found the canals a little bit better and I opened more the space with the trumpet and with the scout, that was so nice because with the scout, I went inside and I start 
to connect all the isthmus to a point that I was free to go back and forth. All this area here, I was cleaning with my scalp. In this point, I like to use the bottles with sodium hypochlorite just to start uh, chemical uh, wash. So this is my two cents about how to avoid perforation <laughs> is to use ultrasonics. Yeah, no, those are some great tips. And when you know when you're using the trumpet, just to clarify, you can't perforate the uh, frication area, the floor, the floor of the pulp chamber. You, you're just going to polish it down because it has a nice broad polished surface. And you can you can do the test if you take the, the trumpet and goes in a strike of tooth, for example, and goes against the pulp chamber floor. Yeah. Nothing happens. Okay. It's just a polishing. Why? Because ultrasonics works laterally. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. work like this, work like this. And even like this, the tip design doesn't allow to uh, do any kind of perforation. Any damage, yeah. yeah. So, so great, great. I'm, I'm just, as, as, as every session, every time as you talk, I'm taking my notes uh, so I can review them. But I think you made some great points. You know, if uh, I, I had this situation yesterday, I think it was tooth number... Um, 19 the patient was having some pain on the lower left area and um you know we took a pa and you could barely see any canals and as far as the pulp chamber as you were describing it was kind of like the roof and the floor of that chamber was squished together and uh you know one of the nice things about being a, a general practitioner is i looked at that and said you know what i need to send you to the expert i need to send you to the endodontist so <laughs> Yeah. Hopefully, you know, that all goes well. And the endodontist, you all love doing those kind of cases. I don't know if you remember, but we, in, in one of my lectures, I spent kind of an hour just talking about what type of cases that you have to refer and what type of cases you can face, right? Yes. So there are some cases that you cannot face. Like, for example, if you cannot do the isolation, the rubber dam installation, don't do it. Don't even try it. Uh, cases of calcification, very calcified canals, those are cases that is pretty much complicated. Cases with crown that you want to keep the crown as well. Those are cases that is pretty much complicated. And we obviously we can talk hours and hours about that, but those uh, those things refer to an endodontist and one endodontist and you don't like too much because yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know you know I, I think it's one of the good things because many general practitioners I, practitioners I speak to they don't do any endo at all and you know I think it's because of that you know when when we see a case and we look at it we think oh yeah it needs endo you know I'll do it and it turns out to be one of those challenging cases it's just daunting and it kind of is, is discouraging so then we don't want to do any more yeah. But I think the nice balance is, is when we have those cases and we get proficient enough to do the cases we feel confident about. And then I think, as you smartly say, those that we diagnose as being difficult, you know, send those out. And, um, you know, I, I think one of the big things about endodontics that um, some doctors realize and some don't is that endodontics can be a very um, important part of the practice's financial health. That, um, you know, by doing an endo or a few endos, a week, you can really improve the bottom line of your practice. And still, you know, I think that's why we're doing these types of webinars is, is if we learn to do them properly and as easily as we can, then, you know, we'll, we'll still be doing a great service to our patients. They won't have to go to another office and financially it can be beneficial for the doctors. Yeah. And there's no marketing for endo, right? Because you're, the, the patient will come to you and say, I, I have pain. So you'll that's have right. There's, there's no need of any marketing at all. Yeah, you know, I think in 34 years, I don't think I had a patient say, well, let me go shop around for another price. Yeah, right. So, yeah. So I think you bring up a good point. It is. True. Um, so we have, we have the magnification. We have the uh, ultrasonics. And I think, you know, one of the things about the ultrasonics, not just the tips of the, the shape of the trumpet and the uh, scout, but I think it's also, as you were showing that close-up photo, what some of the doctors don't realize is that when you're doing it with a burr, the handpiece is covering up the access hole and you can't see where the end of the burr is. Whereas with the ultrasonics, because the length of the shank is so long, you can see where that, where the diamond burr, let's say the ultrasonic is cutting the floor or where your trumpet is or your scat is. And you can actually see where the tip of that is in relationship to the, the floor of the pulp chamber. Absolutely, you're totally right. Another thing is the power, right? So 
when you you can control, you can do a fine tuning with the cutting action of the ultrasonic uh, with the with your motor, you cannot do that, right? Yeah. Even if you are doing a low speed motor, you cannot do that. It's, it will be always way more than the ultrasonic capacity of cutting. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, maybe the GPs are just trying to do everything with their regular high speed handpiece don't realize that it's, it's a blind shot. You just cover that whole access up yeah. and you're kind of feeling around and, um, you know, sometimes that can be very difficult. Yeah, I have a very nice slide showing that it's dark and yeah, yeah, day and night. Day and night. Yep. So these are all things that you've taught me in the past. So I have to say thank you again. <laughs> but there are things that that again, as a GP, not thinking about endo every day, mm -hmm. that um, some of those little things can slip by. But yeah. uh, you know, I hope the GPs that are watching this will pick up some tips to make to make endodontics easier for themselves and more successful. But let's move into the next topic. As you were saying, sometimes we get in those really tight canal spaces. And, you know, I, I'm taking that handpiece and I'm directing my burr, whatever burr it may be, along the long axis of the tooth, trying to stay centered, kind of visualizing where I think the pulp chamber is going to be in that tooth. Um, but there's things that throw us off. You know, restoration and alignment could be different than the roots if there's a, like a crown on the tooth. Um, the tooth could be canted. I mean, there's things that throw orientation off. And as you mentioned, um, I don't know if you're talking about the pulp or the pope, but sometimes we, we pray as we're going down to be sure that we don't get out of that pulp chamber, we don't perforate the floor. But as you mentioned, perforations do, do happen. So um, I know you already kind of alluded to it. I don't know if you have more to say about that, but if I do get in a situation where maybe I should refer it out by dent, maybe I wasn't using magnification and maybe I wasn't using ultrasonic so I couldn't see where my burr was going and I get a little off orientation and I perforate the root. What suggestions would you give a, a GP at that point? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely a good question because it is exactly the sequence that we were talking about. So uh, until 1999, we definitely, we were horrified when a perforation occurs, right? Uh, after 1999, Torre Vineja came with the famous, now famous MTA. That is pretty much Portland's men, but of course, um, kudos for him because they, uh, he, he and his team, they came from Loma Linda. They came with this perspective. And nowadays we know that MTA is one great asset. Uh, it is a lightsaber in your office, right? So basically what you have to do in a perforation that you recently, uh, and, and let's be very clear. I'm talking about a perforation that I, I, I am preparing, I'm doing my access and all of a sudden I see oil coming, not oil, <laughs> but blood, right? And I, oh, what is this? So first of all, use your apex locator. Because your apex locator, if you file, if you point to the perforation, your apex locator, you point to the foramen, like beep, out, right? Yeah. And if you point to a canal, nothing will happen. So I'm not willing to do now a determination of the working list. I just want to know if it is a canal or if it is a perforation. And the easiest way of doing is to use our apex locator with a file, let's say a number 40 file, and I put in where I think that is a perforation. If nothing happens and I go down with my file, nothing happens, wow, that is a canal. It is bleeding, but it's a canal, right? But if it is just you point and then start the noise of out or apex or out, then you have, you have a perforation. Don't panic because you recently did. Problem of perforation is when is an old perforation, there's contamination there. And even MTA will not able to decontaminate the perforation. And you have a lesion, for example, a furcal lesion uh, related with your perforation. That is a problem. That is very, very problematic. But if it is recent and I'm doing my access, I'm trying to find the Pope chamber, all of a sudden I did a perforation for the reasons that you very well, very well determined position of the crown, the angle of the crown, the angle of your handpiece, your vision, et cetera, et cetera. 
I did a lot of preparations in my life. I, I, I did a preparation Sunday morning before the church <laughs> in my father and it was a center incisor. Ah. So, and I was not even drunk or not even in a hangover. I was, <laughs> it was a very classified center incisor. And I was so confident that I was going to have my lunch in my mom's house that day that I just put a, a high speed burn and, woo, and boom oil right mm -hmm. uh, so what do you have to do well first of all let's talk a little bit about the first product that came to the uh, market that was the pro root the pro root from dense supply this is the original dr tora uh formula uh there's a lot of uh there's a lot of little i will not say problems but there's uh, difficulties when you are using this product and the reason is, it's very hard to do the mixing of this product, mm. right? <clears throat> I don't know what's going on here. Oh, here you go. So it's very hard to mix. It's the same consistency. You mix with water. Water has a high tension surface and it's kind of complicated to mix. And when you start to mix, you start like mixing uh, at the very same time. And then you have the same consistency, these big particles, because at that time they had a big advance. That, that, that is true. It was a huge advance, by the way, but it's still with some problems, the color, uh, the radio opacity, and, and the bismuth oxide. Uh, there's, a, there's a reaction with collagen of the dentin and everything starts to be dark. Mm -hmm. So, it was very hard, it still is very hard to uh, do the mixing of this product, even though it's still in the market with this very same formula, but it's very hard. You cannot, you don't have that nice flowable consistency that you need. So it, right, this was one of the projects in my former company. Uh, uh, we came with a micro, uh, particles uh, of, of the powder and with a different liquid that's pretty much just down a little bit the, the, the numbers of the surface tension. So you have a little bit more creamy, let's put it this way, more creamy, more uh, easy to mix consistency and uh, the microparticles allowed us to use a 29 gauge tip to deliver in a very little syringe, like a 1.2 or actually 0 0.8 ml syringe to deliver this product, uh, whatever you want to. There's new products that is already mixed in a syringe, like the Neo Putty, uh, the IOC Repair from Angelos, you have the Endo Sequence from Bressler, all these products, it is proven by studies that they have all bioactivity, same bioactivity that you find in the original MTA. So not only, not, I will show you a sequence of cope capping, but it's exactly what you have to do when you are dealing with a pope chamber perforation. But for pope capping, for example, and now that the American Association of Endodontists, they, they recognize the vital pope therapy uh, preserving the pope tissue in a popotomy or even in a pulp capping. So it is nice to know that now the AAE uh, recognized this kind of therapy after probably 21 years of MTA on the market and, and mm -hmm. being studied a lot. So if you take from 1999 to 2010, 2015, each number of Journal of Endodontics came with one uh, uh, paper about MTA. Actually, they opened a new section just for uh, this kind of a uh, uh, study. So all of a sudden, if you have a perforation or if you have a little explosion of the pulp, uh, the pulp chamber <laughs> with the vital pulp, just make sure that this is not an inflamed, irreversible inflamed situation. And I agree with you. We are going to do a webinar just about diagnostics because diagnostics, the way, the, the way that people learn diagnostics 
it, it is so complicated, mm -hmm. right? So I had a friend that passed away, Dr. José uh, uh, Souza Filho, Francisco José Souza Filho. Dr. Francisco was a one of the most knowledgeable people on Pope and periapical inflammation. It's kind of a second, Hargreaves, I think that is the most knowledgeable one. And then Dr. Francisco was the second one, in my opinion. And if you see his papers and everything, he published a lot of papers about diagnostics and he was a good friend. Um, and we said, why we don't write a little book about just about diagnosis and we did it mm. and we were going to we were going to publish and he passed away uh, he was very young and he passed away um, he was thrombophilic like me he has a big thrombosis in his brain he was not able to survive but uh, I I have this book and we create this mechanism of doing the diagnosis uh, by sections of the innervation of fiber type that you have. Mm -hmm. So we are going to talk about that. But in this case, make sure that it's not inflamed pulp. If it is inflamed pulp, just open and do the root canal or open and do a pulpotomy. It depends on the level of inflammation that you have. But the, the way that you see that, if this bleeding doesn't stop after one minute of pressure with a little cotton pellet, humid color pep, uh, column pattern, by the way, column, cotton pellet, <laughs> cotton pellet. If it is, if you remove this cotton pellet after one minute and it's still bleeding, forget it. This is an inflamed, irreversible, irreversible inflamed pulp tissue, right? But if it is not, you can squeeze a little bit of MTA on the top of this of course, this needs to be clean. You can clean with chlorhexidine, for example, before using the MTA. And make sure that you have a good layer of MTA. This is a good layer of MTA for this case. You see that it's shining. When it starts to be opaque, this is the time to create the layers of your restoration up to the MTA. So it takes around five minutes from this to this situation here. Don't mm -hmm. try to dry, you don't need to. It's just leave there for five minutes. And after that, I like to use a liner. See, when you do in this way, you can even work a little bit with your MTA, try to create a low uh, leveling the MTA uh, down there. And now it's time to create a little layer of liner. You can use any liner that you want. Um, once you have this liner, calcium hydroxide liner, in is light cure, for example, then you can proceed with your restoration. So do your uh, acid etching, and then adhesive, and then of course you do your restoration. It, it will be exactly the same in a pulp chamber floor perforation without, of course, the restoration part. So you have to stop the bleeding, you have to clean everything with chlorhexidine, and then you pour your MTA, wait five minutes, make sure that everything is preset because MTA will set in a way longer way, and, but it's different. Setting time of MTA is different than a composite, for example, that light cure or even a chemical setup, right? So this is a, a very old case that I did back in the day when I was in Brazil and the patient came in this situation here was a recent uh, perforation that the doctor did. And um, here is four years later, right? I, I cannot follow up more than uh, this because the patient is in Brazil and I am here, right? This is another case. Uh, when I removed the, the crown, this canal here is start to bleed, but it was a canal. I made my, uh, with my apex locator, I determined that that was a canal. Uh, this is, of course, is a retreatment. That's why you see all these big openings. Uh, this is the palatal canal. This is the perforation here. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the, yeah, this is the perforation and this is the MB. 
So I just put some calcium hydroxide power, pure PA inside just to stop the bleeding. And then I start to work with those perforations. Look, rubber dam, right? There's no excuse. You can put a rubber dam. I use an interior clamp. I think that is 212 or 214. I can remember the number, but it's those mm -hmm. anterior clamp that has those big wings, right? Mm -hmm. So this is an anterior clamp and I use here my rubber dam. And as you can see here, this is a medical cyanocrylate crylate, cyanocrylate glue, right? Uh, yeah, cyanoacrylate. Cyanoacrylate, yeah. thank you. That's <laughs> why I need you. You, yeah. you translate my bad English, right? Broken. Yeah, Pope, pulp, same pope, thing. Pope, pope, oh, there's so many. Uh, my, my daughter used to do a list of my bad words. <laughs> it's not well, bad both, words, it's broken English words, right? They're both revered, so yeah. that's good. <laughs> so cyanoacrylate, right? Yeah. So this is medical cyanoacrylate. There is a company in Canada that sells these for, even if you don't want to do stitches, you can use this medical cyanoacrylate. Mm. And it's super awesome. That will glue the rubber dam to the borders of the preparation or even to the gingiva. So as you can see here, I have my rubber dam here and I have gingiva here and they are glued. So you can use that. Okay. And I, I think going back to that, the, you know, cyanoacrylate super glue, um, you know, actually sets in a moist environment. So yeah. if some people are worried about, well, you know, glues typically don't work when there, where there's moisture, cyanoacrylate, because it's designed for the tissue, uh, kind of tissue welding was designed to have moisture there. So this is perfect. Right. That is perfect. So here is the perforation. Here is the canal. So I will just put my MTA on the perforation here. I put MTA, uh, I, this is the alteration. Of course here, just because it was too big, the, the opening that the dentist, he put a post there, uh -huh. right? So I did the root canal, I did, I did the alteration and I had some surplus of the MTA here. And I said, oh, I will just seal with MTA that area here, just don't allowing nobody to do any post preparation again in um, uh, uh, DB canal, that is crazy. Just use, of course, the palatal canal like in this situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the last one that I, I want to show. This is a perforation. This is a poke chamber perforation, even though it doesn't seem to be, but it's a poke chamber perforation. Uh, now you can see a little bit better um, the perforation. And this is the X-ray of the MTA right after the perforation. So uh, if it is right after the perforation, I assure you that the, the, the um, prognostic or prognosis of these will be very good. Great. You know, the, um, those are all great suggestions. It's nice to know that we can repair a, a fresh wound. Um, you know, one thing going back to the access, and I, I don't know if, if this works, but the uh, caries detectors, do those help to find the orifices at all too? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So um, caries detectors are awesome to determine the position of the the canal entrances because the color is usually is blue or green. Yeah. So you just drop one or two drops on the pop chamber, then you wash with water, dry, and you can see uh, those uh, little canal entrances. I think that Vista has one. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, going back to the um, act, um, the perforations, do you think that that one case where the perforation was in the pulp chamber floor that the doctor was looking for the MB2 and couldn't find it and perforated there? Definitely, this is the most common situation that uh, among endodontists, for sure, this is one of the most common situations. And again, it's because it was using burrs. Mm -hmm. So uh, burrs are very complicated, especially the long ones, because you cannot control very well. Um, there's a mouse, um, mouse burr um, that is very long and very tiny. Those are for um, people who use CBTC, for example, for uh, mapping everything. There's a guided uh, access as well that you can do with 
like the implants, when you have all those um, uh, things to guide the position. The guide pins, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we have four axes as well. Uh, mm -hmm. This is very interesting. Actually, here in Vegas, there's uh, Dr. Uh, is J A J A I N Jain. Uh, he originally from India, but he is one of the experts on guided access. Dr. Buchanan as well mm -hmm. has a very nice technique for that. Uh, other than that, in a day-to-day -day normal situation, I would say use the ultrasonics instead of using um, bursts to find canals, especially the MG, MB2. Yeah, that's... Um... That those are always tough. You always feel like if you don't find it, leaving something behind, but you don't want to perforate the tooth either in search of it. So yep. yeah, that's difficult. Yeah. And by the way, just remember that MB2s usually, not all the times, but 80% of the, the, the times they join with the MB. So if, if you don't find, don't try to find and, and take the risk of perforation, try to do the best that you can with the MB right and mm -hmm. a good uh, a good irrigation with ultrasonics sometimes you can feel backwards so mm -hmm. I, I i did this a lot in my time if you're using a very flowable sealer and a good alteration system uh, maybe you can backflow and 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 uh, clean with your ultrasonic especially if you're doing the right protocol for irrigation. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Well, so now we've got the access. Uh, we've talked about worst case scenario where we perforate during the access, but now we're we're working our files down, and you know we we, we do we'll, we will want to review a little bit about your files, but as we're going down, uh, maybe it's with our initial files. You know, we're we're trying to make sure that we can get down to the apex of, of that root. Um, the next, I guess, observation that we have to make is, well, how long is that um, distance from wherever our occlusal measuring point is down to the apex of that, of that route? So when I was in school, we always had to take radiographs. You know, you always try to get the best PA, either parallel, so you got true length of the tooth, and then you might offset a little bit so you could get the canal so they didn't overlap each other. There are all these little tricks and it was always difficult. But, um, you know, I know you have been key in developing kind of the electronic version of determining the length of that uh, route, which is our apex locators, apex, um, I guess just the apex locator. So finding that length, um, we've got some new equipment that, um, for us old guys, we weren't taught right off the bat. So maybe some validation of that and then how to get the best performance. Because, you know, some of us have tried different apex locators. Um, do, you, do you want to have it dry? Do you want to have it wet? Is a little bit of blood in there? Okay. Um, I don't know. Enlighten me on the apex locators because I, I know you know a little bit about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Long story short, I started with Apex Locators back in 1987 when I went to Japan, right? So that is the whole story. But one of the things that I have a tendency, and, and I think that other experts has tendency, when you start to do, I did my master of science thesis, my PhD thesis, my postdoc thesis, I wrote a book about it. So every time that you start to focus too much one, in one thing, you forget that people, sometimes need the basis. We call uh, rice and beans, or, or in English, bread and butter, right? So let's, let's try to do some bread and butter. Let's try to go back and say, hey, I never touch bases with an apex locator. Is that reliable? Of course it is reliable. The problem is always with a new device, you have to have some kind of training. There's a learning curve and an apex locator is not different at all. So I myself, when I start with the apex locator back in 1988, when I came back to Japan from Japan and I start to do some clinical cases in my office, it was hard. I, I think that took me probably an year to understand a little bit better and to see, well, this is the file that I have to use. This is the sequence that I have to use, right? At that time, 
the IFU of the Apex computer was a joke, was kind of a turn on, turn off, and that's it. They didn't uh, make anything. I'm, I, I, I wrote probably, probably 10 IFUs for Apex locators in my life. So all dense by Apex locators and in well, the, 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 the first versions of the root CX, um, the fine, the compacts, all, all this, I wrote because I know all these little tricks that you have to do to shorten a little bit the learning curve. So let's see something that I prepare here. So the first thing is uh, we have to understand before Apex computer, we have to understand, and this is me, this is a, a dentistry today. The, this is a paper that is in dentistry today. You can look at the archives of dentistry today. You see this paper there about apical shaping limit and apical cleaning limit. So th this is the first thing that I, uh, the, the GP needs to understand that we have two limits when we are doing the root canal treatment. Back in the day, when, uh, in, when it was vital pope, we stayed two millimeters off the foramen, right? Mm -hmm. And by the way, the name, the, the right name is foramen locator, it's not apex locator, mm -hmm. because we don't, we don't locate the apex. And what is the apex, by the way? There's so many <laughs> definitions for apex that is crazy. We determine the foramen position, that's it. But we have to, because we have two limits. We have the apical cleaning limit that is to the Ecuador of the foramen. So if I trace a little line here in the foramen, that is the Ecuador of the foramen. So this is exactly the point that I have to stop when I want to clean, but when I want to shave, I need to, get, to go back a little bit. So 0.5 to one millimeter back, it depends on your technique. It depends on the accuracy of how you control your files inside the canal. But from 0.5 to one millimeter off, the position of the foramen, that is when you enlarge the canal. So you can enlarge the canal until a 35, until a 40, until a 50 or a 60 or 80, not less than 35, please. But anyways, but you have to keep this area clean and how you do that with your patency file. That little number 1502 hand file that you are going to do the recapitulation or recapitulate all the time with this little file to make sure that this area here is patent. And patency is nothing more, nothing less to keep this area clean to be able at least to your irrigation material goes there and clean this area. That is, by the way, the most important part because this is exactly the window between what you do inside the canal and what the patients see there. All the reactions, inflammatory reactions, all the defenses will be waiting here eagerly for something that you are doing there, removing the pulp content, doing a nice, cleaning and a nice alteration to a point that they say, now we can work and now we can do our defense because the defense cannot go inside the canal as you, the defense cells cannot go inside the canal, right? Mm -hmm. So basically what you have to do is this, you have to clean until the foramen and you have to shape and do your alteration a little bit uh, off the foramen. So if you clean and limit, is where exactly you use your file as a patency file. And this patency file is usually a 1502, maybe a 2002, it depends on the canal that you are using. So this is the APCO cleaning limit, right? The APCO shaping limit is where you are going to create the space to accommodate your good pressure cone. Of course, the sealer will go a little bit further, sometimes too much further, but eventually you have your canal clean. If you are using a sealer like a biceramic sealer, like a resin-based sealer, or even ZOE sealer, it is okay, will be biocompatible, depending on the amount that you are using or extruding. So where's the foramen? And you will said, we had in, back in our days at the university, we didn't have the apex locator there, of course. So you have to take the best X-ray possible and even with the best image possible. And this is a D-speed film that is old fashioned, but more in detail uh, image. You cannot see the foramen exit. 
After your alteration, yes, I can see the foramen exit. Fortunately here, I was able, including to clean that area there and to extrude a little bit sealer. That is where I saw that the foramen was laterally, as usually is laterally. Nowadays, we have CVTC. This is a friend, Dr. Carlos Estrela from Brazil, Dr. Aníbal Diogenes, that is another Brazilian here uh, in San Antonio. And they came with this software. They developed, was a software developed by dentists, endodontists, radiologists, and of course, technicians to be able to, with a CVTC, to be able to determine the position of the frame. And look at these images here. This is an in vivo case. This is a, a, a second software that you can use with your CBTC to determine and do a 3D reconstruction and showing from the apical part where are the foramen positions. That is amazing. It was published in uh, GOE uh, 2018. But the reality, the day-to-day -day reality is this. You take an x-ray, you cannot see anything. Mm -hmm. And how you can like or love to do endodontics if you don't see anything that you are doing. Plus, even in the x-ray, that is the only way of seeing something, you cannot see the working length. So in a situation like this, you create a fear situation. You, you, you lose all the flow of the technique. You just put a lot of fear during your instrumentation. If you see a little blood coming, oh my gosh, I'm passing. Most of times, blood coming from the canal is pieces of poke tissue that you touch laterally. But uh, you have to pass a lot. I mean, three millimeters with a number 70 to start to have full bleeding. Or if it is an inflamed poke, you are going to have a lot of bleeding anyways. So basically, you don't love what you don't control. And to control the working length, in situations like this, it's quite impossible. All those images are coming from my book. And believe me, I did these images in two weeks at university. We just start to take some, take some x-rays during the procedure, during our students' procedure. And it was so easy to pick up those images. They were there. Problem of x-ray is exactly because it is a shallow, uh, shadows in a 2D surface, right? So as you can see here, and they are using, everybody used this little image that I put in my book. It's so interesting. But uh, here is the tip of the file that is passing one or two millimeters. And here is the image that you have in your x-ray. This is the same. This is a real situation. The uh, tip is passing two millimeters or more, and it's still showing that is inside the canal. So this is very complicated. Let's use the Apex Locator. Let's do an Apex Locator 101, right? Of course, you have to buy an Apex Locator. There's so many in the market right now. Um, it's not only Root CX or Root CX2 or Root CX Mini, but you have very reliable Apex Locators uh, in the market right now. I will show you the compacts, but you can use other Apex Locators as well, exactly the same way. Actually, one of my patents is about uh, using the whole spectrum of frequencies instead of two or five. There are some that are using three. We use the whole spectrum of frequencies and this is what we are going to see in the compacts. But anyways, there are, again, many of them. Uh, there's, uh, I, I myself tested, there's a lot of studies showing, so it's very reliable. First thing first, this is me as a patient, as you can see, but uh, rubber dam. There's no <laughs> endo without rubber dam, right? No endodontics without rubber dam. So endodontics, rubber dam. I cannot put a rubber dam. I don't want to put a rubber dam. Refer, right? Refer. Show love of, to your patient and refer. Because if you don't use rubber dam in endo, you cannot do anything. I mean, anything. No instrumentation, no ir especially irrigation, nothing. Mm -hmm. And rubber dam is not only to put the rubber dam, but you have to seal around the rubber dam. You have to seal around the rubber and fill all these gaps because it's rubber, for God's sake, right? So there's no 
a, a perfect attachment. So you have to create this perfect attachment because when you are using your sodium hypochlorite and eventually a little drop of sodium hypochlorite goes around this crown, your patient will start to gag, your patient will start to feel bad, right? After that, uh, take a, uh, do a measurement, uh, sorry, do a measurement of mm -hmm. your image, right? And this measurement needs to be done the most accurate way possible. Determine your temporary working length, removing three millimeters of this measure, uh, measurement that you did, right? After that, let's use our irrigation. And one of your questions is, if blood or pus or sodium chloride or EDTA or water, is this something that will uh, make more or less accurate your apex locator? Answer is no, but you have to control. So ideally you have to have the canal fill with irrigation, but not the pulp chamber. The reason of the pulp chamber is that if floods a little bit and touch, the, the, the environment, let's say, touch your clamp. Clamp is metal, it is touching, you can have a short circuit. Mm -hmm. It's not very common, but sometimes can, uh, can occur, right? So try to use your irrigation inside the canal using a capillary tip or even a aspiration tip. Just make sure that the pulp chamber is free of irrigation or blood or pulp tissue, right? Uh, just sucking a little bit, and then you are going to put a file. Look, this is very important. I put my file inside the canal to my temporary working length without even turning on my apex locator. Don't try to do this with your file out and put your file with the apex locator inside the canal. There's no, there's no need of that. And actually, this will increase the, the, the chance of not having a good result, a good measure, okay? Mm -hmm. Good measurement. Okay. This is one of the words that Annalise always say, it's not measurement, it's measurement. No, it's not measurement, it's measurement. Oh my measurement. God. Measurement, measurement. Yeah, <laughs> it's my accent, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, so after my file is inside the canal, after my file is inside the canal and everything is said, my file is in the temporary working there. It means that the tip of my file is like three millimeters off or four, doesn't matter too much. Then I will turn on my apex locator. Here is the complex, but I will turn on my apex locator. Of course, my cables are attached. Everything is connected with the apex locator. And then I will put the lip clip, right? I put the lip clip and I will put the file clip. So this is the file clip or file connector with my file in position. And you, as you can see here, I had one number 10. Now I have a number 15 because my number 10 was very free inside the canal. And I don't want that. I want a file that the tip of the file is touching that walls. If I need to do some kind of pre-flaring to make sure that just the tip of the file is touching, that is okay, do the pre-flaring first but I will use a file that is not moving. The file needs to have some adaption inside the canal that will make my life easier when I have to go a little bit to the apical part. And that will be very, very slow. So once I have this connection, then my apex locator will start to show something, some bars, four bars, five bars, six bars, doesn't matter. Now it's time to gently, with watch winding movements, watch winding movements, right? Going to the apical part, going, trying to get the foramen. So while I'm doing that, my apex locator is showing me you are closer, closer and closer and closer and closer. To a point that my apex locator is show the number zero, zero. That is exactly the position of the frame. And by the way, this is the most accurate position that you can get. 0 0.5 is not as good as 0, 0. 1.0 is not as good as 0 0.5. 2.0 is not as good as 1.0. So what is the 2, 1, 0 0.5? It's kind of a 
You are closer and closer. Watch out, you are super close. When you are driving in a road during the night and there's an accident there, first thing that people put is some sign saying, beware, there's something there. You are closer and closer and closer. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. So this is the way that the apex indicator works. The only, believe me, the only accurate point on the apex locator is the 0.0. There's a full explanation of that. We can do another webinar just about working that determination. Once I have my 00 pointed, this is the time that I put my rubber stop in the position that we want, in the reference that we want. Use a good rubber stop. Good rubber stops are one millimeter thick. This is too little. This is 0.5, 0.7. I like the one millimeter thick. In the Genius Proflex files, we are using one millimeter thick. Remove my file, go to my ruler, and then I will see if it is like this, 18.5, 18.5 is the position of my foramen. And this is my cleaning working length. This file there will go all the time to search the foramen and to clean that little area. My working length though will be 18 or 17.5. It depends if you want to be off 0.5 or one millimeter. That will be my shaping working length. So there's a difference there. So I determine the foramen. This is the length of my cleaning working length. The patency, 0.51 millimeter off will be my shaping working length. So just to show a little bit What is the working length determination? I always like to use to pre-flare the canal before using my file. Once I put my file, see, I put my file in temporary working length. I turn on my apex locator and I go gently, watch winding movements to the zero point. Put back my rubber stop and this is my cleaning working length. My shaping working length will be one 0.51 millimeter off, okay? This is the apex locator 101. There's the 102, 103, 104. There's the 2000, the 3000, <laughs> but this is 101. No, that, that was a great explanation. I look forward to learning uh, more about the apex locators because, I mean, I've, I've had my challenges with it too. Probably using too small of a file wasn't fitting tightly at the apical walls of the tooth but um, no i think it was great insight so the, those of us using apex locators and you know I, i've been guilty of that i get an apex locator i open up the box i throw the instructions away i'm just okay that's the on button i know how to hook everything up and it doesn't work <laughs> i can't figure like it out the dvds yeah i know never, yeah but, but it's good to to that you said that because one of the two most common things Uh, mistakes or errors is not to use the right file. The file needs, the tip of the file needs to touch dentin walls, not the body, the tip. Mm -hmm. And the second one, it is fun, but this is true. The second one is people who hook up the file and the lip clip and then turn on the apex locator. Uh, Every time that you turn on the apex locator, there is a firmware there and runs and the, these firmware say, let's, uh, Uh, discard the impedance of the yeah. cable, Yeah. right? So if the cable is attached with the patient, everything will be discarded. So the apex locator will not work because mm -hmm. he thinks that your patient is part of the cable as well. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is crazy, but it's true. So okay. needs, to be, needs to be very careful on that. Yeah, no, great information. Well, yeah, I will tell you, we're up at our hour. It went by fast. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Let's do this. I think that what we can do is to leave the, the, the other questions to a second, uh, a part two of the questions and answers. What do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's great. No, I want so to show just one last slide. This is, my, this is the last slide. I just want to uh, invite everybody to... Uh, this first in-person uh, seminar with hands-on that we are going to do. I hope that 
Um, we can count with Dr. Miyazaki as well. Um, he is not invited. He is part of this, uh, but it's very. Uh, it will be a very intimate first seminar. We want to do something very intimate. We want to do uh, not only a hands-on, but touching hands, yeah. right? Um, and for that, we need to, um, of course, respect the situation of the Delta variant of the COVID and everything. Yeah. So we are doing just for six people, right? And these six people, of course, under all these uh, Precautions. precautions, precautions to the yeah. COVID, et cetera, et cetera. But we will be here in uh, Meridental facilities. We have a nice conference room. Um, we will be a full day. Uh, it will be October 90th. So uh, maybe if you are uh, coming to the uh, ADA uh, meeting that is called SmileCon, we'll be in Mandalay Bay here in Vegas. And uh, it starts on Monday. This will be uh, Saturday. So I hope that we can uh, have a very nice in-person this time. More information about this will come in our website. No, that's good. I'm excited to see this. And I, as we mentioned before, there's nothing better than the face-to-face, hands-on type of experience Absolutely. versus a, a webinar. So uh, we thank you for putting that on and Metadenta for sponsoring these webinars and, and the course. So um, we look forward to seeing everybody there. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's stop now. We are going to do another round of uh, questions and answers. Um, just take a look in the website in metadenta.com slash webinar. Um, uh, very soon we are going to put another date there and schedule another webinar. And of course, this October 90th, it is not in the, our website now, but will be very soon with all details, everything that we're going to, to have here. Okay, Dr. Mike, thank you very much for joining and, and, and co-host this uh, webinar. It's always a pleasure and I, we lose time when we are doing this. Yeah, you no, are and, honest. I know that your endo is perfect. It's I know. Awful. I have a lot of questions to bring to the table. So we're just getting started. <laughs> yeah, definitely, yes. All right. Okay, well, all right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. We see you next time. All right. T thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.